Hello everybody, welcome to what I tend to call an evening with Mr Marsh. Now I've done a couple of these before and things have changed since Covid and the lockdowns and it's very difficult to get out and meet people now. So this is how we've got round it. We like to do these evening with presentations and the ones I've done before have very much been aimed at ladies and related to breast cancer and so on. I thought it was time to do something that relates perhaps mostly to men. So welcome to All About Hernias. Now I'm grateful to those of you who've sent in questions and what I've tried to do is structure a general chat over an hour or so during which I hope I can answer most of the questions you've sent in about hernias and how to treat them and so on. So the sort of things that we will try and cover hopefully are mostly straightforward but hopefully you'll learn new things. So we'll talk about what a hernia actually is and why you get one and what problems it can cause if you don't do anything about it. We can have a look at how you treat hernias which includes potentially not doing anything and then we'll look at the different sorts of operations and this is where a lot of the controversy is now and we'll look at what are called open operations so that's where you have a scar at the front of the groin against the laparoscopic ones these are the ones done with the little telescopes that go into the tummy through perhaps two or three little scars and then we will talk about the use of mesh or not and there's quite a lot to talk about there and we'll cover that and we need to talk about the complications of surgery because any surgery, any operations have complications and before you have an operation you need to know what those are so you can be fully informed about the potential problems and then we'll come back to looking specifically at the problems with mesh. It's important you know what recovery is going to be like an after an operation. I've actually had a couple of operations myself and one of the things I learned from having two fairly big operations is it does take you longer than you expect to get over it. And then just at the end, we'll briefly look at some of the other causes of pain in the groin and where that can come from. Specifically, we'll look at Gilmore's groin, something else that we do here, and a thing called the Asia syndrome. Now, I'd like, if I may, just to give you a bit of background about our clinic here. Here we are, 108 Harley Street, and the gentleman on the right, the late Jerry Gilmore, who founded the clinic back in 1991. Now, I've been here since 1999. So that's 23, four years. And what we've got at 108 Harley Street is a truly independent collection of different consultants that can act always in the best interest of patients to get things done and get the best outcome. So you can see from the bottom half of the slide, obviously there's our breast clinic. We have sports injuries. We have colorectal team. We have some dermatologists doing skin things. We have vascular surgeon looking perhaps at varicose veins. We have our own x-ray and imaging suite for not only doing mammograms for ladies, but ordinary x-rays and ultrasound scans. And then we've got the Gilmore's Groin and Hernia Clinic, which will form the basis of what we'll talk about tonight. We have women's health and gynaecology, and we have our own day surgery unit where we can do local anaesthetic operations. So there's a lot that goes on, but tonight we're going to pick just the groin and hernias and have a wander through that. So the first thing, and perhaps very straightforward, is what is a hernia? What's the cause and what problems can you get if you have one? Now, when you go to medical school, this is the definition that you have to learn of a hernia. And it's drummed into you until you can recite it in your sleep. So technically, and forgive me, it's protrusion of part or the whole of a viscous. Now, a viscous is any organ, anything internally through the wall of the cavity that normally contains that viscous. Now this actually covers all sorts of hernias. So you can, for example, get a hernia of the lens of your eye, which can protrude through the capsule. So you can get an, a lens hernia. You can get a muscle hernia where the muscle breaks through the covering of the muscle. You can get um, hernias of the stomach that go up into the chest. They're uh, called hiatus hernias. Um, but we're going to stick to the common ones, and I'll show you some pictures in a minute. And it's mostly inguinal hernias, umbilical hernias, those around the belly button, or those slightly higher up in the tummy that are called epigastric hernias. And then there are femoral hernias, which tend to occur in women more than men. If you are a man, a quarter of us are going to get a hernia at some point, whereas only 2% of women will eventually get one. And pre-COVID, 
the NHS was doing 100,000 hernia operations a year. Now that's obviously changed and we'll come back to that in a minute. And if you have an operation for a hernia, the Royal College of Surgeons says there's a 5% chance that you'll get another one on the same side. And there's actually a 10% chance you get one the other side as well. But again, we'll come back to recurrence when we talk about the recovery. But it's important that the Royal College of Surgeons says that on average, if you have a hernia repaired in this country, you have a 1 in 20 chance of it coming back. But we'll come back to that. And they can. Hernias can be a pain in the groin. This is a piece I wrote for The Guardian a couple of years ago that just outlines very briefly the sort of things we're going to talk about today. Um, some of you may have seen it, but as I say, we'll go through it again. And here are some just stylized pictures. So the ones we're going to talk about mainly, on the left-hand side low down, you can see it says indirect inguinal hernia. And slightly above that is direct inguinal hernia. Now, it's not easy to tell the difference just by feeling, even though it looks like it should be very obvious there, it's not that straightforward. And in fact, you repair them in a very similar way when it comes to an operation. On the right hand side, low down you can see the femoral hernia. Now, everybody thinks these are the ones that tend to occur in women, but in fact, two thirds of groin hernias of women are the inguinal ones, and a third of the femoral ones. In men, 98% of the inguinal ones, and 2% of femoral. So I've not done many femoral hernias in men, but I've done quite a lot of inguinal hernias in ladies. The umbilical hernia is the ones at the belly button, and above that, sort of in a straight line going up, you get what are called the ep epigastric, or sometimes you'll see them called ventral hernias. And they're just over on the right-hand side, they put an incisional hernia, and you can get that through, for example, if you've had a big operation with a scar down the centre of your tummy, you can get an incisional hernia, you can get it through appendix scars, you can get it through laparoscopic port scars. So those are the, the incisional hernias. And there are some real ones. So that one on the top left is probably a direct hernia. It just looks like it. Um, I'm right about two thirds of the time in trying to guess. Belly button number like a hernia in the middle. And if you're unlucky enough, on the right hand side, you can see a big incisional hernia. Now these are a different kettle of fish altogether. And we'll talk about the, the techniques for repairing the umbilical and the inguinal ones. But if you're unlucky enough, to have that sort of hernia on the right, that is probably going to involve what we call a full abdominal reconstruction that is going to have to involve some sort of mesh or other. And one of the good things about being at 108 Harley Street, we have a whole team of people who can do different techniques. And I'll show you a picture later, but my colleague, Mr. Amadarik Shan, is the expert in the more complex abdominal wall reconstructions if you're unlucky enough to end up with a hernia like on the right. But we're gonna deal with the more common, more straightforward ones. Now, just to show you what is not a hernia, chaps particularly, or ladies, if you've had children, if you do an exercise called a plank, and you'll know what I mean, and then you look down at your tummy, you will often see this swelling that goes all the way along the length of your tummy. Now this is actually called divarication of the rectus muscles. And the rectus muscles normally meet in the middle and they're the ones that give you your six pack if you're lucky enough to have one. And as you get less young or if you've had children, they just separate slightly in the middle. So when you strain, you get this bulge down the middle. Now this is normal. There's not a lot you can do about that. I suppose you could technically cut all the way down the tummy and tighten everything up, but then you're at risk of all the complications of big operation, including a true incisional hernia. But this is not a hernia and nothing needs to be done about it. Um, I've got a bit of it. Um, most chaps of a certain age have, and I say a lot of ladies who've had children will have this divarication of the rectus muscles about which you don't need to do anything. So if you get an inguinal hernia, these ones in the groin, you will nearly always get a lump. Now, having said that, I see a small number of chaps, and it is usually men for these, who come along with, they've had a pain in the groin, often quite a severe pain, and you examine and you can't feel anything. And often we'll even do an ultrasound scan and we can't see anything. And sometimes it is, it's just a groin strain, it settles down. But I see a small number who six months later will phone up and say, I've got a lump now, and I go, right, come back and we'll fix it. And what I think happens is when you first get an inguinal hernia, the muscles in the groin have to split to let the hernia through. And that initial splitting can be quite painful. And then what happens is the pain goes away and the lump becomes more obvious. 
So most pains in the groin, and we'll come back and we'll talk about some other causes, are not the beginnings of hernia, but a small number can be. Now most hernias are what we call reducible, which means they go back. So often when you wake up in the morning, it's not there. You get up and about and a bit later in the day, you're aware of the lump, you lie down, you can push it back. And it's usually more obvious when you stand up. And often if you go and you get your hernia looked at, certainly I will examine you standing up and that's the best way to feel a hernia. After the initial pain, they're often not particularly uncomfortable, but they can be. And as they get bigger, they can get more uncomfortable. And that's one of the reasons for having it fixed. If it doesn't go back and you can't push it back, we call it irreducible. And just on the last line now, I want to talk about these three different terms. So an incarcerated hernia just means it's stuck and it doesn't go back. So that's the same as saying it's irreducible. Most hernias will just have fatty tissue in. There's this sheet of fatty tissue called the omentum that covers the bowels and the tummy, and it's usually that that comes through. If you do have a big hernia and it does have loops of bowel in it, occasionally the bowel can get pinched, so the contents of the bowel can't move through. That then becomes an obstructed hernia, and you tend to find you get swelling in the tummy and you're often a bit sick with that. If the bowel inside the hernia twists and the blood supply of the bowel is cut off, then it's called a strangulated hernia. So most people who are referred with hernias are absolutely fine, they have reducible hernias. Occasionally it's irreducible, but people are still fine. If it's obstructed, you have the symptoms of tummy swelling and vomiting and nausea, but you'll never really know if it's strangulated until you operate, because you can't tell until you see it with an operation. Strangulated hernias are rare, it's about one in 500. I haven't seen one for a long time. But sometimes those terms are confused. So incarcerated just means it doesn't go back. Obstructed means the bowel is caught and the contents can't move through and it has other symptoms and signs as well. Strangulated hernias will present as obstructed hernias and you'll only know they're strangulated and the blood supply to the bowel is damaged when you do the operation. Very rare. So the cause is and the reason it's mainly in men um, is that the anatomy of men and women is different. Forgive me, but I have to say that it's different. Um, there are three layers of muscle around the tummy. The outer layer of muscle has an archway that in men, all the blood vessels and structures go down to the testicle. It's called a spermatic cord. That's quite a big structure. It's about the size of your thumb. And that goes down through this archway. So the archway is quite wide. And that's the site of anatomical weakness. In ladies, that archway is much narrower. There is a structure that goes through it. It's called the round ligament of the uterus. It doesn't do anything, but it's a much narrower archway. So inguinal hernias are much less common in women, although most women who get groin hernias will get inguinal hernias. It's the same with the umbilical hernias. The umbilical is the site of anatomical weakness. There's scarring there from where the umbilical cord was. So it's a site of weakness. It's also thought probably that it's due to perhaps raising to abdominal pressure and pregnancy is a classic one for this. Um, people wonder whether too much exercise can cause hernias. Do you know, I probably don't think they do. Um, coughing and sneezing, possibly. But again, I think from 20 odd years of doing this and talking to people and about hernias and their family, I think most hernias are probably built in deep down in the genes and you're probably going to get them whatever you do. And I may occasionally see somebody who says, I was putting something heavy in the back of the car and my foot slipped and I got a pain and the next morning it was a bit sore and by lunchtime I got a lump. And that may have brought it on, but it was probably going to happen anyway. So I think most hernias are nobody's fault, they just happen. The reason I put smoking on there is not because it makes you cough, but smoking actually affects the enzymes in the bodies that rebuild things. So you're not the same person you were five years ago. You've been drip down and rebuilt, all your atoms are different. And smoking affects what are called the collagenase enzymes, the connective tissue enzymes that help put you back together. And if you smoke, you're not so good at rebuilding yourself, and so all your muscles and connective tissues are weaker, and you're more prone to hernias. So another good reason to give up smoking, or vaping for that matter. So let's have a look at what you do if you've got a hernia and you want it treated. Now, bear with me, because I think it's always interesting to look back and see how we've got to where we are. So, I'm going to give you a short history of hernia repairs. 
Now this chap, an Italian surgeon, Eduardo Bassini, he started doing hernias back in the late 1800s. Now bearing in mind, general anaesthetics only came in in the 1840s. So within 40 years, he was doing a lot of general anaesthetic hernia repairs. And of course, the general anaesthetic made the difference. And he looked at a series of his of 262 operations. He had seven come back and 11 post-operative infections. Bearing in mind, we hadn't really got to antisepsis or certainly not antibiotics by this stage. So his recurrence rate was 2.7%. So 150 years ago, he was doing better than the average hernia surgeon now. Now, what he did, and again, forgive me, the, the detail is not vital on this slide, but what he did was get completely familiar with the anatomy in the groin. He studied the muscles, the ligaments, the nerves, and he realised what happened when you got a hernia and how the muscles split and how the back wall, so the posterior wall of the inguinal canal, how that becomes weak and lets the hernia through. And what he did using sutures was to anatomically restore the anatomy of the groin. So he put it back as it should be. So he removed the hernia sac or pushed it back. He reduced it and repaired the muscles and tendons of the groin as they should be in an anatomical way. And that's how he got such good results. So that was the first, if you like, good series of hernia repairs. Now, in the 1940s, this chap, Edward Earl Scholdice, set up the Scholdice Clinic in Toronto, Canada, which was set up to help these poor young men who had hernias who couldn't be drafted into the American forces. So he would fix their hernias so they could be drafted. I'm sure they were very grateful. Um, but this set up an almost hernia factory that people would go and work there, do nothing but hernias, often as day cases. And this developed the Scholdice Repair. Now, the original shoulder ice repair actually involved a metal wire, believe it or not, but it was not that dissimilar to what Bassini did. It was an anatomical sutured repair. And you will hear me talk about anatomical shoulder ice type repairs, because the trouble is in medicine and surgery, different things mean different things to different people, or rather the same thing can mean different things to different people. So I talk about an anatomical shoulder ice type repair, by which I mean a sutured anatomical repair. And what the original shoulder ice repair was, they went along and back and along and back in layers. But again, it was an anatomical sutured repair. And because all they did was hernias, not surprisingly, they got very good at it and a very low recurrence rate. And that's how young registrars like Marsh there learned how to fix hernias in the late 1980s and early 1990s. So I learned to fix hernias using shoulder ice type surgery with sutures, understanding the anatomy of the groin. Um, and that's what I told Sue Lawley in 1995 when I was working in Cambridge and we got interviewed for uh, whichever BBC medical series it was at the time. Now, in the mid-90s, Irving Lichtenstein on the left, that rather severe looking chap um, in Los Angeles, released his results of what he called a tension-free mesh repair, now run by Palmer's Amid on the right. And what he did instead of having to understand the anatomy of the groin and put it all back together again, he just pushed the hernia back and put a patch over the top. Now you can imagine if you've got torn muscles, the torn muscles still underneath there, but the patch stops the hernia coming through. And this came in in the UK in the NHS in the mid nineties and everybody started doing these. There is a slightly different mesh repair if you like, and you can see this mesh here sits on the front of the groin and I think quite importantly there are three nerves that will sit underneath that mesh that can potentially get caught up in it. You can do a slightly different thing where you can take a little mesh plug, now this is like a little tiny rolled up umbrella, you put it through the muscles behind and then it opens up behind the muscles, so not where the nerves are in the back, so you can get a sort of mesh repair from behind as well and this is called a mesh plug repair. And then what you do after that, you then repair the muscles anatomically over the top as well. So this is sort of a double repair, if you like. And the reason, particularly in the mid-90s, that this became so popular, I'm talking now about the Lichtenstein mesh patch repair, is that it was said to be an easy technique for an inexperienced surgeon to learn. Now, in those days, almost all hernias in the NHS were done by surgical registrar, so trainee surgeons like young Marsh, you saw in the, in the Radio Times there. Consultants didn't do it, the registrars did. 
And you didn't really have to understand the anatomy of the groin, which is actually quite complicated, one of the most difficult things to teach. It was said to have a low recurrence rate and a low initial discomfort. That's not true. It was said to be easy to teach, probably true, and you could do it as day surgery, which you can do hernias with anyway. You can do it as a local anaesthetic. Uh, it's not great, I do do hernias under local anaesthetic. It's uncomfortable. General anaesthetics are so safe that it's better. And the other thing about a general anaesthetic is when you have a general anaesthetic, your muscles in the groin are very relaxed. So it's very easy to get a really good solid, if you like, double-breasted repair, which you can't do with local anaesthetic. It was also said to be cheap, and that probably isn't the case either, but those were the reasons it was brought in, and everybody did it, and I remember learning how to do it. Didn't like it, and I stopped doing it pretty quickly. Now, the other thing, of course, now, in terms of how you have your hernia done, is that hernia repair is rationed on the NHS. That's actually my late mum's original ration book from the war, um, which I found in one of the drawers when I was tidying up. Um, but there's no doubt that if you want your hernia on the NHS, and I still work half a week in the NHS, it's getting more difficult. And it's been difficult quite a few years, even pre-pandemic. What were called then the CCGs were rationing hernia repairs. And the Royal College of Surgeons obviously quite rightly warned that people are going to be left in pain um, and it could potentially cause complications. As we've said, the complications are actually uncommon, but your hernia getting bigger and therefore more difficult to fix is quite common. So you have a situation where almost 60% of the clinical commissioning groups then restricted access to hernia surgery, and that had gone up in the four years. And yes, potentially there are more adverse effects and a bigger hernia potentially is more difficult to fix. And as we said, that involves still 100,000 hernia operations a year. But interestingly, in the four years between those reports, there was no change in the number of emergency admissions. So although hernia surgery was being rationed, it wasn't adversely affecting the emergency admissions. But you had things like eight of these CCGs wouldn't let you have your hernia done until it was stuck, irreducible, not necessarily obstructed or strangulated, but irreducible. Or they wanted a GP to say, yes, it was increasing this amount every month. Now, you know, hernias don't do that. They come and go and they come and go. So that's a bit daft. You had almost all of them saying you couldn't have your hernia done until you were suffering from pain that was so bad you couldn't work. You had a small number that did follow the Royal College of Surgeons or the BHS as the British, British Hernia Society guidelines and some of them didn't have any policy at all. And for example in North Essex where I work in the NHS, if you were felt to be overweight you would not have your hernia fixed, you would not be allowed. And that began to build up a whole reservoir of people who needed hernias doing. And then of course, we had the pandemic where all the elective surgery was suspended and you had a large backlog of patients needing, if you like, routine surgery. Most of these were gonna be hips or knees, gallbladders or hernias. And that's gonna take years, even now, to clear. And then of course, we have all the effects of the current strikes, which are gonna make things even worse. I had a chap come to see me um, to have his hernia done. He wanted to pay for it himself. He'd been told, by his GP, it was an 82 week wait on the NHS just to see somebody, not have it done, but just to see a consultant. Um, and the NHS had no choice. It had no choice but to do what it did in the pandemic. And those are simply the figures and results that have happened because of it. You can do nothing with your hernia. The first two pictures there are of trusses. I'm sure you've heard of trusses and they have pads on that will hold your hernia back. On the right, you can see an abdominal belt. So if you've got an incisional hernia, an umbilical hernia that's symptomatic, that may help. Um, I'm not a great fan of trusses unless there really is absolutely no chance that you're going to have an operation. So you may not want an operation, absolutely fine. You may have medical conditions that just makes operating unsafe. And in which case, yes, that may help with the discomfort. I don't like using them temporarily before an operation because it tends to cause scarring around the hernia, which can actually make the operation more difficult. So unless you're really not going to have an operation, I wouldn't use a truss, but potentially you can do nothing. Now again, the NHS likes this term called minimally invasive hernias or minimally symptomatic men, and it won't repair your hernias if you're said to be minimally symptomatic. And again, forgive me quoting a medical paper, it's this paper that they use as the basis for that. It's an American paper from, what, 17 years ago. 
and it looked at people with small hernias, it didn't cause many symptoms, and it took just over 700 men and it divided them into two, and one half of the group they said, we'll just see how you go, and the other half they said, we'll fix your hernias, and they followed them up for nearly five years. And what happened is that about a quarter of the people who were in the we'll just see how you go group, their hernias got bigger, got more painful, and they crossed over to the group to have an operation. And about a fifth of the people who'd been listed for an operation said, no, it doesn't bother me, I'll go back and we can just watch. In that series, they had one who developed an irreducible but not obstructed hernia, and one obstructed hernia. So that's, that's if you like, an adverse outcome every 1.8 per thousand patient years. So that's not common. So again, it's just over one in 500. So it is, the NHS would contend, safe if you have minimal invasive hernia to do nothing. Now, my problem with that is, if you're 70 and you've got a small hernia that causes no trouble, the NHS doesn't do it. When you're 80, it's gonna be bigger and causing trouble, and you are gonna be 10 years older and potentially more problems. So I'm not sure I subscribe to this. Um, and I would get hernias fixed when you've got them. If you've got an obvious lump, I think it's time to fix your hernia. Now, in terms of the operations, you'll see, you'll see phrases like this. The, the two big groups are what are called the open and the laparoscopic group. The open hernias are where you have a scar from the front. You don't go inside the tummy, you do it all from the front. And as we've seen, you can use a mesh patch, you can use a plug, or you can do an anatomical repair with no mesh. With a laparoscopic repair, that's where the telescopes go into the tummy. And they, you'll see these phrases, tap and tap. You can do it from completely inside the tummy, or you can do it sort of half inside, but it always uses a mesh. And that's the big issue, and there's a lot of discussion about that. We'll talk about that in more detail. But the other things to think about, if you're having a hernia fixed and you can choose, have a look at who the surgeon is, find somebody who's done a few, I would say don't go to somebody who says they never have complications or have never had a recurrence because they have probably haven't done very many. Recurrence happens, it does. Um, my own recurrence rate is about 1 in 400, in over 2,000 hernias over 20 years, which is considerably less than 5%. Um, but I know because you remember your recurrences because it's always disappointing when it happens, but we know it happens. Think about the technique, so think about open laparoscopic mesh, non-mesh, and then think about the potential complications that you'll get from each one. I'll have a look at these in a minute. And these can be early, simple things like pain, late recurrence, and potentially serious ones. The NHS has to look at the economy of things, I'm afraid. This is where NICE, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, comes in, because this guides us on what we're allowed to do on the NHS. And we'll have a look on what that tells us as well. So if you look at the complications of open hernia, a scar at the front, do everything in the front, not going to the, not going to the tummy, the common complication, you get wound infection, less than 1%. Recurrence, 5% of the Royal College of Surgeons says one in 400 in my hands. A hematoma is a big blood clot that can cause quite a lot of swelling, sometimes down in the testicle. They go away, but they're a real nuisance. In older chaps, particularly those who've got a bit of enlarged prostate, it can cause trouble passing urine. Not because it affects the bladder, but because you get pain and discomfort afterwards, it can send the bladder into a bit of spasm and you can't wee properly. Small number of chaps will need a catheter for a day or two to settle that down. It's very common to get numbness. So you, I mentioned these nerves. You have to move the nerves to do the repair. And as soon as you touch a nerve, they tend to go numb and shut down. They then go through a phase of being slightly oversensitive before they go back to normal. And each phase can actually take a few months, so it can be numb for a while. Obviously, it's painful. I make no bones about the fact that for the first few days after I've done a hernia list, I'm not particularly popular, but it settles down very quickly. And the rare thing is the damage to the cord down to the testicle. That's very uncommon because you move it to the side when you do the operation, you keep it out of the way. Now, if you look at the complications of laparoscopic surgery, not surprisingly, exactly the same, at least for the first page, because there are a few more. So you can perforate if you're inside the tummy, the stomach or the bowel or the bladder. You can injure the, the ureters that carry urine from the kidneys to the bladder. You can injure the liver, you can injure the spleen. So there's a whole nother page of potential complications with laparoscopic surgery. There's another page as well, because you can damage the main blood vessels the aorta, the IVC, the inferior vena cava, the iliac blood vessels down to the legs, 
the inferior epigastric arteries on the tummy, the ovary, ovarian or uterine arteries, they use a lot of diathem, which causes thermal injuries, and because you're inside the tummy, you cause adhesions, which can stick the bowel together. So that's you know, another page. And there is another page. It can affect the heart. You can get gas embolism, all these stuff. And there is yet another page. And, and again, the, the actual detail is not hugely important because they are very uncommon, these things. But these are all things that can happen with laparoscopic hernia repairs that do not happen with open hernia repairs. And you can get sepsis, peritonitis, abscess, fistulas, and this thing called disejaculation for men, which is a really awkward condition, much more common in laparoscopic surgery compared with open surgery. So many more potential complications with laparoscopic surgery, but they're all rare. And what I would say, it's probably fair to say, is whichever way you have your hernia repaired, the vast majority of people are absolutely fine. But it's a matter of what can you do to keep the complication rate as low as possible. And it's interesting that, that people have this perception that most hernias are probably fixed laparoscopically now. And it's not true, and they never have been. And as you can see, if you go around some of the countries in Europe and North America, it's really less than 15% apart from the Netherlands there. And even in America, it's only 8%. And that's falling, and we'll talk about why that is. So in fact, the majority of hernias are still done in the open traditional way, although most of them at the moment with a mesh of some sort. Now I mentioned NICE, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, and what they say about laparoscopic surgery is it can be used as an option for pairing hernias, but it caveats that by saying there are some risks involved which may include serious problems. And if you look at what it says about the mesh plug, where the plug is put behind the muscle, it doesn't actually comment because it says procedures don't fall into the programme for remit if they're considered standard clinical practice with an efficacy and safety profile that's sufficiently well known. And the same applies to the anatomical shoulder eyes type repair. Because it's standard and it's well known, it doesn't come under the NICE remit, it doesn't have to warn you about other serious potential complications. Now, I need to credit the chap on the left. Robert Ben David used to run the Shoulder Ice Clinic and I would meet him round Europe as we went round conferences talking. Um, he sadly died in 2019, the same year as Jerry Gilmore. Um, but I used to love chatting with him and he had come up with what he called the Newton Ben David First Law of Statistics, I think on the right, because one of the frustrating things is getting accurate information across, not only to doctors, also to the public. And Robert Ben David's point is that for every statistic quoted in the surgical literature, there will be an equal and opposite statistic reported in the same literature and probably in the next article. So in other words, when somebody tells you that laparoscopic hernia repair means you go back to work more quickly and there's less pain, the next article will tell you exactly the opposite. And it's very difficult because people don't like publishing studies they've done if it doesn't say what they want it to say. And my late father-in-law, who was a structural engineer, used to throw his hands up at medical studies and say, this is not proper science. Most of the time, you're just making it up. That's what he used to say. It's not quite as bad as that, but you've got to be really careful when you interpret articles you may read about. How, having said that, I'm going to look at some studies and see what that tells us. One of the things I find interesting is the number of studies on laparoscopic hernia repairs dropped off dramatically after 2010, which I find really interesting. But it started back in mid 90s to say it came around the same time as the mesh repairs. And you can do both successes a day case, but laparoscopic surgery was much more expensive. We'll come back to that in a minute as well. It was very straightforward to point out that it takes longer and there are more complications. We've talked about that. Again, another study in 1998, it's more expensive. These things are important to the NHS. You can find studies that say the outcome is similar. So there's no particular difference in chronic pain, perhaps, but we'll come back to that. Or recurrence, again, we'll come back to that. Again, 2003, longer operating time and higher recurrence. And 2007, more serious potential complication rates with laparoscopic surgery. Despite the fact that a lot of studies you'll see will tell you the opposite. One good study from European hernia group looked at what's called a meta-analysis. They look at lots of studies of laparoscopic hernias, they clump them all together. 
So what they found was it may well be associated with an early return to work compared with sutural open hernia repair OHR or the more recent mesh repairs, which they mean the plug, not the patch. But the outcomes are equivalent with the open repairs, cost less, potentially less severe complications. And their recommendation was that we should not be doing laparoscopic hernia repair as a standard for primary hernias. We should go back to the open hernia repair either sutured or with a mesh plug. What they actually found from this study, which was in Denmark, that what they called chronic severe inguinodynia, this is what medicine does, it gives things posh names. This is just chronic pain after a mesh hernia repair, 13%. This disjaculation thing, this really distressive symptom, 3.1%, 100 times higher than an open repair and nearly 11% of people getting pain during sex activity after a laparoscopic mesh hernia repair. So, thinking about laparoscopic hernia repairs, there is a long learning curve to do it properly. It's at least 200 cases, probably up to 1,000. It does take twice as long. And what I find interesting is, apart from it always being mesh, how often people who have a laparoscopic hernia repair tell me, Oh, yeah, they did the other side as well, because when they had a look, they said there was one there too, even though they had no symptoms on that side. Now, one of the things that's really misleading, and you will have heard laparoscopic hernia repairs called minimally invasive. All this relates to is the size of the scars. You may have three 1.5 centimetre scars. Now, my hernia scars are growing about five centimetres, so overall not that much bigger. But on a laparoscopic hernia repair, the area that they have to dissect, so to clear round on the inside of your tummy is three times larger than the area I would work with with an open hernia repair, and the volume is nine times larger. So this is not actually minimally invasive surgery at all. It is a bigger operation than having it done from the front. In terms of the lower complication rate, well, that probably isn't true. It's about the same and there are more potentially serious complications, but again, I would just say most people have hernia repairs, whichever way it's done, end up being fine. Yes, it's much more expensive. That's a picture of a mesh going on the inside of somebody's tummy. These are large meshes. And what happens, they will then wrap themselves around not only where her hernia is, but also the major blood vessels that supply your leg. So taking one of these out is pretty much impossible. And one of the things we used to discuss with the, the Shoaldice group when I'd meet them around Europe was whether this laparoscopic hernia thing is just a marketing strategy. You have to remember that it's, it's an 18 billion pound a year industry and these laparoscopic companies who make all this equipment have a lot to lose if we suddenly decide it's not worth doing. I just put that out as something that we used to talk about. Now this year, in March this year, an article by John Glass, who's a surgeon in guise for the Royal College of Surgeons, said that laparoscopic hernia repair has come and in the most part gone. In other words, we really should be moving away from laparoscopic hernia repair. It does not have the advantages it was sold as having, and it has potentially much higher and more serious complications. That was the Royal College of Surgeons. That's not me, that's the Royal College of Surgeons. So, if you're gonna think about having a hernia repaired now, the top left with the big X is the big mesh through the tummy laparoscopic hernia repair, not anymore. The bottom left with the big X, that's the Lichtenstein, put the patch over the defect where the muscles are torn and potentially over the nerves, probably not that either. Mesh plug, yes, okay, I don't have a problem with that. Um, and then you're back to the sutured anatomical repair which is where we seem to be heading again. This is where I do my hernia repairs, although I'm based at 108 Harley Street where we consult, but the Weymouth Hospital top left is where we do it. I like the Weymouth Hospital because it's small, you get much more individual attention, you're well looked after, and actually importantly, if you are paying for this yourself, and this is important, um, they give us the best package price for having your hernia done as a day case, which is £3,300 at the time that I'm talking. 
Top right is just the waiting room at the beginning, that's the, the operating theatres, and there's one of the rooms, and you get your own when, they're where, when you're there. Most people say come and go the same day. Um, yes, you can stay the night. There is an extra hospital charge for that, which is about £500 a night to stay the night, but most people will get out in and out the same day. But it's £3,300 for the operation, anaesthetist, surgeon, hospital stay, and that includes your follow-up. It doesn't include, I'm afraid, the additional consultation, but that includes the follow-up as well, and that's the correct price as I'm speaking today. Let's have a look about what happens after you've had your hernia fixed. Well, I'm very keen on giving you as much information you need about the operation, including all the complications we've talked about, which are rare but happen. We give advice about wound care. Now, in general, that's very straightforward because I use dissolvable stitches under the skin. There's nothing to remove. We put paper strips on top of that and then a shower-proof plaster. And just for 24 hours, you have a big padded dressing that just stops you bruising too much. And that comes off the next day. We're also very keen that after a few days, you start doing some exercises. So the first few days is just walking around to loosen it up. If you go back to bed or spend the weekend in the chair, it stiffens up and it takes so long to get going again. So we're keen you walk around little and often and then start some stretches. It's a really important part of strengthening the muscles after hernia repair and it also reduces the risk of recurrence and of getting one the other side. So these are the sort of things you'll get. You can look at these on our website. Uh, we talk about open, no mesh, inguinal hernia repair, all about the operation. There's discharge advice and then there's the the uh, exercise we'll get you to do. On the bottom right, you'll see it says stage one, two, three, and four. Now in the old days, that used to be week one, two, or three, or four, but in fact, most people progress more quickly than one stage a week. And by the time I see people a month later, people have pretty much been back to normal for a couple of weeks. It will still niggle and pull for a bit, and it probably does that for a couple of months, but it doesn't stop you doing things. But what I do at a month is just check it's all solid. So if people are particularly sporty or do heavy work, just to make sure they're all right to go back to work. In terms of recurrence, this is the sort of typical recurrence graph you'll get, and the colours represent the number of hernias that you do. And it's no great surprise that the more you do, the fewer recurrences you get. Now what's interesting, if you look at the bottom line, the red line, the shoulder ice repair, so the recurrence at 10 years is about 1%. Whereas on average, it is, it's about 5%, the Royal College of Surgeons tells us. But if you do a repair where you understand the anatomy of the groin and you suture it anatomically, you have the lowest recurrence rate. Yes, it helps if you do a lot, but you just have to understand the anatomy. And it is one of my huge frustrations that anatomy seems to be less important than medical school now. And sometimes I do throw my hands up and wonder what anatomy they do teach young doctors these days. But anatomy doesn't seem to be it. And if you understand the anatomy, you will get better results. Now, problems with mesh, which we have to cover. It was about 2016, 2017, when we began to get headlines like this on the BBC website. Hernia mesh surgery leaves men in pain. Now it starts, of course, with ladies having the mesh for prolapse repairs, um, but men found they were getting the same problems. And you would get NHS hernia mesh repairs leaving patients in chronic pain. And you can hear heartrending stories who are people who are in a lot of discomfort after having their hernias repaired with a mesh. But again, most people do not have trouble. So, were hernia mesh repairs leaving people in chronic pain? You get people saying like they feel a scratching from the inside. Some people always have really, really agonising pain and feel a fiery burning pain, or it never stops hurting or itching. And you get people who say, I used to play a lot of sports, but now they can't do anything because every movement is painful. Some of those, and we'll mention that, may not have had a hernia in the first place. I mentioned that I deal with a condition called Guillemot's groin, which we'll come back to, but this is a, a muscular injury of athletes who tear the muscles in the groin. There's no hernia, there's no lump. And that has to be an anatomical repair. Because if you put a mesh over these young athletes with their torn muscles, the muscles are still torn and they get pain. And I will see people who come and see me and say, I had a hernia repair six months ago with a mesh and it still hurts, why is that? And I will say, oh hernia, how big was the lump? They said, I didn't have a lump, I just had symptoms of pain when I was playing football. And of course they never had a hernia in the first place. And now you're in a situation of, do you need to try and take that mesh out? So yes, 
in a small number of people, they do leave people in chronic pain. And if you look through the studies, and particularly if you look at the ones that are hard to find, you will find that an instance of pain after a mass repair is up to 78%. The average from that European Hernia Society in Denmark is 10 to 11%. You can, if you've had a Lichtenstein type mesh operation, you can take that mesh out. And I do do that. Not often, it's a last resort, but I do. But if you've had one of those laparoscopic inside the tummy meshes, they are almost impossible to get out. And because of the way they wrap around the blood vessels, that's potentially very dangerous. Now, I mentioned I used to go around Europe to lectures. This is Bill Bell. This was the last European conference on hernias and chronic pain we went to before COVID hit. And that's the Guggenheim Museum in Bill Bell. And it was a conference almost entirely dedicated to problems with mesh. And the summary is, yes, it's a foreign object. So it can be rejected by the body. And because it stiffens the groin, the body can't adjust. It stiffens the muscle. Yes, OK, if you've got a hernia, it's obviously coming back, but it stiffens the muscles. And I'll show a slide in a minute. But what you get is disordered nerve growth into that mesh, which can cause pain. They also showed slides and studies where the mesh bits of the mesh break off or erode into nearby structures like the bad of the bowel or the, the vat in chaps. Mesh can roll up and become displaced. And I do see people who have mesh repairs. When you examine them, you can feel the mesh is rolled up. The mesh breaks down and then there's the mesh fixings. And I actually took a mesh out of a chap a couple of weeks ago where the mesh had been fixed in with staples, proper metal staples like you have in a stapler. I just find that bizarre. Um, you can get things that staple in that dissolve or they're even glued in now. Um, but again, the glue then sticks everything together. But there are problems with the fixings. As we've said, if it was a Lichtenstein open mesh re repair, it can be removed. Laparoscopic one, you're stuck, I'm afraid. So this is a slide. The yellow is the nerves. And you can see, so I beg your pardon, the, the yellow is the mesh and the brown of the nerves. So you can see how the mesh is eroding into the nerves and also into the vas in this one. So bits of the mesh break off and erode into structures and will cause pain. Now, if you remove the mesh, from all the studies that have done, collected by Robert Ben David in, in Toronto and in his clinic there, you will find that just under a third of people do have their pain completely cured and nearly half are much better. About a fifth are a little better. One in 20 have no change and some feel much worse. And I'm aware that if you look, you can find surgeons who say, I will take the mesh out and I have a 100% success rate. That isn't tenable. I'm sorry, it just isn't. This is what you need to think about if you're having a, a mesh removed. Now, I have to say, although it's difficult to give you a large series in my hands, so I do it so rarely, most people actually are very great and do very well. The chat I did a month ago took the staples out. He just feels much better. What you have to do, of course, when you've taken the mesh out is anatomically repair the groin, because often you find you take the mesh out and there's a big hole at the back where the hernia is. So you have to understand the anatomy to do that but it's, it's about two thirds will get a bit better or completely better. As we said before, for a surgeon to claim 100% of anything should arouse suspicion. And surprise, surprise, the Royal College of Surgeons have said there's a mess-free alternative for hernias, which some surgeons have called for the NHS to teach its staff so patients can have a choice. That's great, I agree with that, except there are so few people now who know how to do mesh-free, suited anatomical surg surgical repairs of hernias. That's the trouble. So how are you going to teach it to people if there are a handful of us left, if that, who know how to do it? And it's a bit like, and again, Robert Ben David, and I give him credit for this, he used to show these three slides. And on the left is Chartres Cathedral in France. And that blue dye, that stained glass blue colour, Nobody knows to, how to do that anymore. The chap in the middle is Stradivarius. Nobody can make a Stradivarius violin like that anymore. And the, on the right, these are called Caucasian rugs, and the weaving is distinct, and nobody can do that. 
and the expertise to make these wonderful things has been lost and the expertise to repair inguinal hernias anatomically is also being lost and I think that is a huge concern. So here are some thoughts. If you look worldwide the different techniques of doing inguinal hernias hasn't really changed the operation for occurrence and 14% of hernia operations for occurrences and that hasn't changed. The techniques have changed, that figure hasn't, which suggests that there is really no one technique that's superior to the others and what matters is having your hernia fixed by somebody who's done more than a few. Remember, it can take a thousand operations to be competent at laparoscopic hernia repair, even if we should be doing it and there's doubt about that now as you've said. Laparoscopic hernia repair really isn't that common and it's getting less common and the recurrence rate, I mean, they're broadly similar um, between 1% and 3%, but there is no one technique that gives you much lower recurrence rates and the instance of severe chronic pain after mesh repair is probably 10%. So those are perhaps the things just to take home. So you do have a choice. You can have a pure anatomical shoulder ice type suited repair. You need a surgeon who understands the anatomy of the groin, and I would say that's something we're good at here because of the way we treat the sports injury, the Gilmore's groin, which you have to have a complete understanding of the groin. It probably has a lower complication, possibly slightly higher recurrence, but probably not. The open mesh plug repair, where the plug goes behind the muscle, again, because you're going to repair the muscles over the front, you need that anatomical knowledge. And it's been said perhaps that's the best compromise between the lowest recurrence rate and the lowest complications. But again, as we've seen, the recurrence rate is probably similar for all of them. If you have a mesh repair, open or laparoscopic, that actually does seem to give you the higher chance of chronic pain. And there really aren't any other advantages in terms of recurrence. But there is a choice and it's important that you're aware of that. And again, I would emphasize most people, whichever way it's done, end up fine. So there's three of us that fix a hernia here. There's old Marsh top left. In the middle is uh, Emin Carapetti, who's my colleague who also would do suture repairs. Amir Derek Shan, bottom right, he's the chap who's the real expert in the complex abdominal wall reconstructions, which will need a mesh of some sort. But we can cover whatever you'd like. He will also do laparoscopic repairs, although decreasingly so. Now, just to finish off, we got asked some questions about other causes of groin pain, although remember, most hernias are uncomfortable rather than painful. So if you're gonna think about the other causes, you have to think about the other structures around the groin. And there are lots of things that can actually give you pain in the same area. So you have to think about the bony things, and pain in your hip joint, interestingly, will give you pain in the groin crease. In the same way, if you have a heart attack, the pain goes down your arm, the pain from your hip joint will go into the groin crease, down your leg and through into your buttock. Not only the bony things, I think that are soft tissues, the muscles and the nerves. So there is, unfortunately, a long list of things that can cause pain in the groin, from arthritis in your hip, um, to tears around uh, the cup of the hip joint. Um, again, sportsmen get this thing called femoroacetabular impingement syndrome, where the hip joint is not quite the right shape and it knocks against the cup. And then you can get these things in young people and young teenagers, slipped epiphysis and perse syndrome. Um, I have seen somebody with a fractured neck of femur sent to me as a hernia because he had pain in the groin. It was very obvious as soon as he walked in that he'd broken his hip. He did it skiing, did it 10 days before he came to see me. But again, fractures around the hip bone and the pelvis can also cause pain in the groin. And then there's this condition called osteitis pubis, which is an inflammation in the disc at the front of the pelvis. Now, it's the same, you have disc in your backbone, you have a disc at the front of your pelvis. This can get inflamed, it causes pain, often in both sides. Nerve entrapment, you know, I'm not sure about, but these three nerves in the groin, the ileo-inguinal, genitofemoral, ileo-hypogastric, some people will say they can get trapped in muscle tunnels, and if you release them, that can help with the pain. Some people deliberately cut some of these nerves when they repair a hernia, which of course makes the area numb, so there's no pain. Um, but that can be quite distressing if it's permanent. You can get what's called bursitis. A lot of bony bits have little fluid sacs over them to protect them from rubbing. You can get this around the iliopsoas muscle, which is the muscle that runs down the back of the tummy into the groin. And you can get it around the trochanter, which is the bony bit you can feel on the outside of the hip. And then you can get tears of all the muscles around. 
And as well as that, you can get what's called referred pain. So if you have trouble with a disc in your back, that can cause pain in the groin, as can pain from the kidneys or the ureters. Sometimes um, stones can present as pain in the groin, as can pain in the testicle, or in ladies, gynecological problems can give you pain in the groin. So those are all the things that you think about as well. Uh, there again, Jerry Gilmore on the left. So Gilmore's groin is one of the other things that, that we specialise in here. This is a sporting injury. That's a subject of a whole nother talk. If you'd like, let us know. I can do that. Um, but that's a whole nother talk. That's a distinct set of symptoms and signs, almost always in young athletic men and occasionally women. It's not a hernia. There's no lump. Now, we also talk about my colleague Paulie, Professor Paulie and I. Paul's a, an orthopaedic consultant but specialised in sports and exercise medicine. And I obviously do the Gilmore's growing surgery. We, we talk about this adductor symphysis inguinal axis syndrome. So on the right hand side, as you come up, the yellow bit in the middle is the disc at the front of the pelvis. The light blue bit just down to the left is where the adductor muscle come up. The dark blue bit going off and to the top left is the inguinal area. And we talk about this C-shaped axis because it's all about function. And you might hear about another syndrome that's called plaque, which depends on the anatomy of the muscles, and um, it falls down rather because it depends on the pier's pyramidalis muscle, which 80% of us don't have. So I'm not sure about that one, but I'd rather talk about function. And it's these three things are interlinked. So if you get trouble in one, you'll often get trouble in another. Not all of it needs surgery, um, but we talk about the, the Asia syndrome. And sometimes it's injections for Paul, occasionally you might need a groin repair, sometimes an adductor release as well. But that, that's how we talk about it, and that's another, re, uh, another cause of pain in the groin to think about. But again, it's a whole nother talk. So, we're nearly at our hour. So we've talked about what a hernia is, the causes, the problems you can get if you do nothing. The way you can treat hernias, including doing nothing at all. The different sorts of operation you have. Open, laparoscopic, mesh or no mesh. The complications of surgery and how there are far more potential complications of laparoscopic surgery. We've talked about the problems with mesh and particularly illustrated that by giving the data from the big conference in Bilbao in 2019 that gave you a realistic picture of what happens if you try and remove the mesh. Remember, laparoscopic mesh can't come out. We've chatted a little bit about the recovery and the recurrence rate and we've looked at other causes of groin pain including referred pain, Gilmer's groin and the Asia syndrome. So that's probably enough for me. That's 59 minutes. That's where we are. That's our website. Look us up.